Remember, a Hallmark card. When you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you a true story from the life of Charlemagne, starring Cornell Wilde on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Edward Arnold. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This Sunday, our true story is transcribed from the life of King Charles the Great, a man whose deeds have made him a legend under the name of Charlemagne. We speak today of a united Europe, well, Charlemagne did it. We speak of the need for spiritual rearmament. Charlemagne actually accomplished it. We are pleased and proud to have as our star, Mr. Cornell Wilde. Now, here is Frank Goss. Here's a timely reminder. Is there someone you know who's convalescing in the hospital? Or perhaps some child is home with a cold? In either case, if you'd like to take a moment that will brighten someone's whole day, go to a fine store that features Hallmark cards and select one of the many Hallmark Get Well cards. These cards are bright and cheerful and always in the best taste. And each card carries an extra compliment, the Hallmark and crown on the back, the symbol that you look for when you care enough to send the very best. And now with Cornell Wilde starring as Charlemagne, Mr. Arnold brings you the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Europe in the Middle Ages and mankind at the crossroads. The Roman Empire had fallen and with it the civilization man so proudly built. The face of Europe in this eighth century was a maze of strange names. Saxony, Lombardy, and Franklin. The forerunners of France, Italy, and Germany today. The kingdom of Franklin was divided in equal parts. Half ruled by a young man named Carolman. Half ruled by his older brother, Charles. That is, until the 4th of December in the year 771. And on that particular evening, a man, head bowed, stepped into the night air. Physician! A moment. I beg your leave, sir. Forgive me, physician. I am Father Michael from the court of Charles. Is there news? The king is dead. Carloman, dead. A mere youth. Youth? He was 20 years of age and grown to maturity. Did he not rule half the kingdom for three years? Besides Charles, your Carloman was a child. Oh, I know there was nine years difference between them. But it took a kingdom to bring maturity to Carloman, whereas Charles brought maturity to his crown. What of this Charles, this king of yours? The balladeers and court sing songs of prowess. His forehead stands majestic. His nose is as an eagle's beak. His eyes are the eyes of a lion into which no man may see. His voice is iron, but gentle. Then take the message to him that his brother is dead. And Charles will be crowned king of all the Franks. You study your words carefully, Father. It is the beginning of an era, physician. Where it will end, no man may foresee. Yet this night has been marked in the heavens. Perhaps... Yes, Father? Perhaps tonight, as God made Charles king of all the Franks, he smiled. Order all horsemen to break ranks and ride forward to search the grove. If it is safe, we will make camp there for the night. Order the cooks to stand ready to make the fires. We will have food as soon as we are settled and sentries have been posted. Yes, Your Majesty. And tell the horsemen to be thorough. We want no Saxons for dinner guests. Aye, sire. There are so few Saxons left. Surely they will eat very little. Ah, Father Michael. The campaign against the heathens has gone well, sire. You must be pleased. Battle won is not a war. 
I thought you did well at Erisburg, but then I am a simple priest, unused to flowing banners, trumpeting foot soldiers and pageantry. Pageantry, is it? Our nation's warriors, the pride of the Franks? More rabble than warriors, I imagine. Call them rabble, Father, but it was this same rabble who won the fortress of which you speak, a victory unequaled by my father's greatest army. I thought we had won a great victory, but then I am so ignorant of matters military. What's your say, Your Majesty? I've ordered the men to begin setting camp. We'll send Yoris and his men to find fresh water. Sire, the horsemen have found a strange object in the grove. They asked me to report it. Yes? A column of wood standing tall in the center of the clearing. A column covered with strange markings and carvings. None of us have seen such a figure before. Then we had best study it more closely before dark. Coming, Father Michael. Coming, sir! There, Your Majesty. All indeed. Forty hands high, I'll wager. Notice the strange figures, sire. Hmm. Intricate carvings. The work of heathens. I've heard of this idol. It's called Ermansal and is said to contain unnatural powers. It is worshipped by the Saxon tribes as Christian men worship the Almighty Father. Can men pray to a stick of wood? And make sacrifice to it and give to it weird carvings unfit for all but pagan eyes? Yes, sire. Men can pray to such things if they have not found God. Galen, sire, get a woodsman. Have the heathen's idol hewn to the ground. Sire. Yes? Could we not leave it as it stands? Surely not. Hewn to the ground. Yes, sire. Oh, father, why should a brave man's courage shrink to axe a heathen's idol? In each of us there is superstition, your majesty, born of ignorance. This business with the idol, in it is the struggle for man's enlightenment. Perhaps, father. Well, where are the woodsmen? Sire, the woodsmen will not fell the idol. There is magic in it. The men swear it. All the men, all of them. Yes, sire. They will come to the grove at once. Yes, sire. And Galen, bring me an axe. You are troubled, sire. Uh, three days there has been no water. Three days since the leather bags have been empty. The men are still searching, Your Majesty. The men have searched a week. Yoris, who has never failed us, can find no water. Half my army beats the woods for a hidden spring, an underground river. While our campsite sits beside a dry riverbed. I know Your Majesty's concern, but surely we will find... It is not the finding of the water that matters now, Father Michael. It is the men themselves. You talked of superstition and fear. Well, we have it now. An army filled with it. Your Majesty? Come forward, Galen. Sire, the men... Don't you think I know about the men? Am I a monarch who hides behind his throne? I'm with them every day. I ride beside them. I eat beside them. I fight beside them. Uh, I'm sorry, Galen. Well, tell me about the men. They asked me to come to you to respectfully request... Well... To request permission to restore the Saxon's idol. What? To place it again as we found it. Not to worship it, Your Majesty. Merely to place it in the ground. It has been no secret that our water bags became empty the day the idol was cut down. Oh, yes, the men have made much of that, even to me. I knew of their fear, their anguish, but this. This from Christian men? Sire, the men swear they will not pray to the idol. But suppose... Suppose there is some magic, some evil spirit, and we have angered it by destroying this... Father, do you hear these words? From Galen, my right arm? I hear them, your majesty. Can these be Christian men? And frightened men. And frightened men who are capable of strange emotions, of panic, of mutiny, of destroying not only their king, but themselves. Well, father? It must be your decision, sire. Galen. Yes, sire? Tell the men to turn their prayers to God. Tell them only he and his infinite wisdom can bring them comfort. And tell them the idol of the Saxons is destroyed forever. 
Yes, sir. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Wake up, wake up. Yes, yes, what? Sire, come quickly. What? Galen, what is it? The dry riverbed beside our campsite. It is filled to overflowing. Water, your majesty. Suddenly the river is filled with water. What? It is a miracle. God has sent a miracle. Mountain water. Imagine mountain water. Where could it have come from, Father? Where? Where? Yes, we are a long way from mountains. Yes, a long way. Perhaps its source is an underground spring, as Yoris suggests. That is quite possible. But whatever its source, it has saved the lives of all of us. Are you... Asking me if the water is truly a divine miracle, sire. No, Father. Let us say it was a favor. A favor granted us by a power greater than you or I. That is a way of seeing it. A way of belief. More than belief, Father. I know now that someday, in some way, I'm going to return this favor. <laughs> moment, we'll bring you the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. We all like to be remembered on our birthdays, but we're especially touched when a birthday card looks and sounds as if it had been chosen just for us. Well, Hallmark cards always have that something extra, a certain personal touch, an added distinction and originality. And that's so true in the sparkling new collection of Hallmark Slim Jims, those elegantly tall, distinctively slender cards that stand out even before you take them out of their envelopes. This new collection of Slim Jims is now on display at the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. And you can find these new Slim Jims easily because they're displayed in smart new highlight racks. There are some delightful new Slim Jim birthday cards that seem made to order for those important people in your life, like a husband, wife, mother, or sweetheart. There's one, for instance, with a beautiful design of butterflies in a wonderland of flowers, and it has a special message to sister on her birthday this lovely card will be warmly appreciated both for its beauty and its personal words. You'll find Hallmark Slim Jims for all sorts of occasions besides birthdays and for every special person you know. And like all Hallmark cards, each Slim Jim bears an added compliment on the back, the familiar Hallmark and crown, the symbol that you look for when you care enough to send the very best. And now with Cornell Wilde as our star, Edward Arnold brings you the second act of our true story from the life of Charlemagne. And now with Cornell Wilde as our star, Edward Arnold brings you the second act of our true story from the life of Charlemagne. Under the sign of the cross did Charles conquer. His first campaign after the death of his brother was in Saxony where he forced the heathens to surrender. With victory assured, he moved his court to Theodore's villa in what is now southern France. For the young king, it was to be a period of rest, but no sooner had he settled than a crisis occurred. It began in February 773, and the imprint of it was to affect the destiny of the entire world. One moment, Rabner. Uh, good sir, show me to your king. I said a moment. This matter is urgent and is the king's business. I have a message from the Holy See. Follow me, traveler. And shake the dust from your robes, lest you show disrespect for my king. In here. A traveler, sire. Why, Galen, bring him into the light so I may see him. 
A humble messenger, sire, from His Holiness, Pope Adrian. His Holiness, you come from Rome? Aye, sire. Well, step forward then, messenger, and complete your purpose. From His Holiness. Wait, come closer. You are a priest. Yes, sire. My name is Peter. Well, forgive me, Father, I did not recognize you. His Holiness begs you read his message and act at once. Hmm. Under attack? What is this, Rome under attack? Desiderius. It is true, Your Majesty. His army is moving down upon us from the north. The Lombard troops have blocked all passage to you, and I was forced to make my way here by boat. Can the Lombards be such fools to attack the church? Galen. Yes, sire. Send a messenger to Desiderius. Tell him I would meet with him at once. Tell him that... I beg admittance, Your Majesty. Well, what is it? My name is Sinis, sire. I come to your court as ambassador from the king of Lombardy. Desiderius. Come forward, Sinus. Tell us what manner of greeting you bring from your king. Of peace to all men, sire. Is your army a day's march from the walls of Rome, as this messenger tells me? It is, sire. For what purpose? To establish justice. To seek the return of lands belonging to the Lombards, but taken recently by men of the church. The lands have always belonged to the church, sire. Desiderius has no right to them. And tell your king, Sinus, to withdraw his army. And I will send to Rome a commission. Three men, a bishop, an abbey, and a courtier. They will decide with honesty what is just, and both sides will obey by their decision. What honesty may we expect from a bishop, an abbey, and a courtier? You dare this blasphemy? A moment, Father. Sinus, what caused your king to send you to my court with this greeting of peace? Desiderius knew you would soon receive a messenger from the Pope. It was his desire that you should hear the true circumstances. For Desiderius also knows that you and your army have just completed a vast and victorious campaign in Saxony. That your army is weary, as are you. That it would ill suit the Franks to wage war at this time. And so he entreats you thus. The Lombards' quarrel is with Pope Adrian, not with Charles. Leave it so. How say you, Father Peter? The cause of justice is any man's cause. A war against God is every man's war. This is the essence of His Holiness' message to you. Hmm. Galen, the army has been sent to their homes and their farms. Provisions expended in the Saxony campaigns have not been replaced. To raise an army now, we need to order every count and every peasant and every Those weapon. Those men owning horses will form the cavalry. And those with armor will bring the mail for their protection. Each village will provide a wagon train containing food for three months, arms and clothing for half a year. Every landholder is expected to appear under the banner of his count. And the king's vassals will bring all their free retainers. The poor shall walk on foot with what weapons they may fashion for themselves. Reply to your king thus, Cenus. Tell him Charles, king of all the Franks, has received his message. And this is his reply that beginning this day will the armed host of Charles march to Rome. Our purpose, to defend with our lives the Holy See, and tell him death to any man who dares stand in our path. never seen such an army, sire. Good cause can sway multitudes, father. Will there truly be war? That depends upon Desiderius. My guess is that he has stepped beyond the line of turning back. But to attack the Holy Church, what possible reason, your majesty? Power is given to man by almighty God, and he may in his own good time take it away. The power of Desiderius has corrupted him because he has forgotten its source. Your majesty! Yes, Galen. The Lombards. Stretched across the plains, many thousands. How far ahead? Two hours' ride, sire. Tell Bernhard to come forward. Aye, sire. Tell Paul to equip his horsemen for the first attack. We will assemble our council at once. Yes, sire. So there will be war. Yes, father. And these men you are about to fight, do they fear no god? Father, I cannot answer for the Lombards, but I have always followed one rule with barbarians and heathens. Either enlighten them or exterminate them. Sire, 
Yes, Galen. The Lombards have reformed their troops at Pavia. How many of them remain? Less than half a thousand. Order our men to lay siege. But, sire, we could attack now and finish it. They are done. There are women and children of Pavia, you know as well as I. But we may be in the field three months, and if we fail to... Our time has less purpose than one child's life. Lay siege and let me hear no more of it. Aye, sire. Which proves God's infinite wisdom in the giving of power. Oh, Father Peter, you should have remained in camp. My place is here with those who need me. Is it finished? The Lombard army cowers behind the skirts of women and children, those that are still living. And Desiderius? Hiding with his men, soon they will be starved into submission. The threat to Rome is ended. But there will be other threats, sire. As long as there are godless men, there will be godless deeds. Are you suggesting, Father, that I can cure the world's ills? No man can cure the world's ills. I am suggesting something far simpler, Your Majesty. I am suggesting that you come with me to Rome. To Rome? To the Holy City. To the court of His Holiness, Pope Adrian. My father and my father's father both spoke of a journey to the City of Saints. Yet neither lived to travel so far from his native land. From Pavia, the journey is not long, sire. Very well, Father. We will see Rome. Sire. There below in the streets is the reason you were greeted 30 miles from the city and escorted to the very steps of St. Peter's. I have dreamed of this, Father, to visit Rome, to be inside the Cathedral of St. Peter. And so you arrived on a path of rose petals strewn by a hundred children singing hymns to your greatness. Your holiness. I kiss your robe. Arise, King Charles, that I may pay homage to you. Your holiness, the king of all the Franks feared lest he kept you waiting. King Charles, you did not keep us waiting. You kept us alive. Father Peter, Your Holiness. Please close the windows and the door of the study that the king and I might have private words. Yes, Your Holiness. Good king, will you sit down? Thank you, Your Holiness. You have done what no man in all the world has done, Charles. You have conquered Saxony and now the army of Lombardy. You are indeed king of all the Franks, the Saxons, and the Lombards. The Lombards still have Pavia, Your Holiness. My army now surrounds them. So it is only a question of time. A question of time also before you are no longer a king, but an emperor. For yours will be the empire of all Europe, united under one ruler for the first time in history. I confess that I am not displeased at the prospect, Your Holiness. Nor am I, King Charles, for you are a man of God. And your mission is to spread his message for mankind. In you, therefore, mankind has a hope for survival. Then I have your blessing. You have my blessing and my support. When the time comes, I shall proclaim you king of Lombardy, and my people will welcome it throughout this land. And when that time comes, Your Holiness, I make this pledge to you. That justice shall reign wherever the banner of Charles is unfurled. That men shall know freedom from tyranny. And that, above all else... Men will live in a nation under God. These words have been said of Charlemagne that he built no great cities, left no enduring monuments, nor did he enrich the world of art, of literature, and of science. His success was spiritual. Perhaps more than any other single man, he brought Christianity through the Dark Ages. For first, last, and always, Charles the Great, who did indeed become Emperor Charles, was one of the world's greatest statesmen, for he brought the world out of darkness and united Europe under the banner of Christ. Now, here is Frank Goss, Mr. Arnold and Cornell Wilde will return in just a moment. I'm sure there are many people in your life with whom you'd like to keep in closer touch throughout the year. There isn't time often to write long letters, but there is an easy and delightful way to contact them as frequently as you'd like. Just use Hallmark Decorated Note Papers. 
These attractive notepapers have just the ideal space for a short, newsy note. And their distinctive designs add a charming and appreciated touch of beauty to your note. Hallmark notepapers are so convenient, too, to have on hand for invitations or thank you notes. And they're handy also for the college set during exam time when students are especially busy but still want the folks at home to know that all's well. You'll find a wonderfully wide choice of Hallmark notepapers on display at the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. Some of these boxes of notes have designs that are delicately feminine. Others have the smart, simple designs most men like to send or receive, while others have a gay, light air about them that young people prefer. Hallmark notepapers cost only 59 cents, $1, or $2 a box. They're surprisingly inexpensive, especially since each note bears the familiar Hallmark and Crown on the back, the symbol that you look for when you care enough to send the very best. Now, here is Edward Arnold with Cornell Wilde. I'll bet those Hallmark notepapers make it easier for mothers to get uh, the youngsters to write thank you notes, eh, Connell? Yes, Eddie, I'm sure that not only would the children love them, but they're handy for almost everyone. There's so many times when you don't have to fill a whole sheet of paper to write a thoughtful note. <laughs> That's certainly right, Connell. And now our thanks to you for an inspiring performance of Charlemagne tonight. Oh, my thanks for being invited. Tell me, whose story are you, are you telling next week? Well, next week, our story is to the life of George Washington Carver. Perhaps one of the greatest agricultural scientists of all time. From the lowly peanut, he created an entire industry. It's an unusual story. And by the way, the following week, our true story is from the life of Sir Winston Churchill. With the Prime Minister's permission, we are going to dramatize the exciting escape that actually took place when Sir Winston was a newspaper correspondent during the Boer War. Hmm. Well, those both sound like very unusual programs, Eddie. I'll certainly be listening. Oh, well, that's fine. Good night, everyone. And thank you for being with us, Cornell Wilde. And so, until next week, this is Edward Arnold saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. The Hallmark Hall of Fame is produced and directed by William Froude. Tonight's transcribed script by Mr. Froude. Heard in tonight's cast were Jack Edwards, Herb Butterfield, Frank Gerstle, Jack Crucian, Edgar Barrier, and Barney Phillips. Cornell Wilde can soon be seen starring in the motion picture The Big Combo, which he also co-produced. This is Frank Goss, saying goodnight to you until next week at the same time when you'll hear a true story from the life of George Washington Carver on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Over Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia, the people behind the Iron Curtain hear the voices of their own countrymen, the voices of individual citizens who have escaped to the free world and who tell them the truth. You too can help on an individual basis by contributing money to build more stations. Send your contributions today to Crusade for Freedom, care of your local postmaster. This is the CBS Radio Network. popular sweethearts. She's my little Margie, a young lady whose mission in life is to make her handsome 50 ish father behave. Be listening to My Little Margie tonight at 7.30 on KNBC. Stay tuned now for Jack Benny. This is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri. The installment loan department of Commerce Trust Company offers you the modern, convenient way to finance the purchase of a new or used automobile at low bank rates. No delay. Convenient monthly repayments. Come to Commerce Trust, 10th and Walnut. At the tone, 6 o'clock. <laughs>